Good afternoon, East Coast time, and welcome to the October Innovation Connect. Uh, this is hosted by the Department of the Air Force Chief Data and AI Office. And my name is Colonel Ryan Keogh. I'm the Deputy Chief Data uh, and AI Officer, and I'll be your mentor, uh, mentor, mentor and moderator today. So the purpose for the Innovation Connect is to create a collaborative atmosphere for those working within the DOD to cross-pollinate ideas across the organization to enhance innovation and identify and solve problems related to R&D and scaling. And we're excited about today's event and our, our, our guest. And uh, thank you all for attending. Before we actually jump into the meat of it, though, I do have a few housekeeping rules to share. Um, if you are not the presenter, we please ask that you keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. Our speaker will give an overview of his topic, followed by a Q&A se Q session. We encourage you to ask questions using the chat feature throughout this presentation, though. Uh, second, we also ask that you keep your questions to the topics presented and refrain from media-related questions or advertisements of your company or organization. Uh, questions will be read aloud immediately following the presentation and give our, our guests an opportunity to present. Uh, and for this month's Innovation Connect, uh, we have the DAF Deputy Chief Information Officer, Mr. Winston Beauchamp, where he will provide an overview of the enterprise IT modernization and company EI tasks and an interconnection between zero trust architecture and the DAF data fabric. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, as I said, Mr. Winston Beauchamp. He is a member of the Senior Executive Service and is the, uh, as I said, the Deputy Chief Information Officer for the DAF, which uh, is comprised of both the Air Force and the Space Force. Mr. Beauchamp joined the Air Force in 2005 to serve as both the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force for Space and the Director, Principal Defense Department Space Advisor Staff, the Pentagon here in Arlington, Virginia. In this DOD role, he was responsible for integrating and overseeing DOD space capabilities and policy, coordinating with the intelligence community, and providing support to the Secretary of Defense on space portfolio decisions. Additionally, as the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force for Space, he provided the principal support to the Undersecretary's role as the Headquarters U.S. Air Force Focal Point for Space Matters and coordinating activities across the Air Force Space Enterprise. Prior to the establishment of the Space Force, uh, this was prior to the establishment of the Space Force as an independent military branch within the DAF. Now, as a Deputy Chief Information Officer, Mr. Beauchamp assists the Chief Information Officer in leading three directorates and supporting over 20,000 cyber operators in support of uh, support personnel around the globe with a portfolio valued at over $17 billion. His oversight, uh, or he provides oversight of the Air Force's information technology portfolio, including, including information technology investment strategy for networks to cloud computing, enterprise policies, information resources management, IT innovation initiatives, information assurance, and other related matters for the DAF. He also delivers cybersecurity and enforces Freedom of Information Act and privacy laws and integrates Air Force warfighting and mission support capabilities by networking and securing air, space, and terrestrial assets. And with that, Mr. Uh, with those efforts, Mr. Beauchamp has propelled the DOD and the DAF to new heights, and we're excited to have him present at today's event. And with all that said, Mr. Beauchamp, it is truly a pleasure to have you join us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Ryan. I'm just going to do one little editorial uh, comment before I dig in. Uh, <clears throat> Ryan was kind enough to add about a decade to my Air Force experience. I joined <laughs> in uh, 2015 uh, to be the Deputy Undersecretary for Space. And prior to that, I'd spent the previous 20 years or so in the intelligence community, really working back and forth between the boundary of, of uh, space technology and IT. And so I figure it's uh, it's my turn of the barrel on the IT side. So I'm 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 here now, uh, but there's really a lot of a lot of synergies that that we can talk about maybe another time. But I I appreciate the uh, uh, adding an extra ten years of Air Force time uh, onto my uh, resume, uh, but uh, uh, we'll we'll go with what we have. Yes, sir. Apologies. So no, no, it's all right. Um, so I'll 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 start off by saying that uh, what you're about to hear. Uh, is is derived from a presentation, a keynote that I gave at the DAF Data and AI Forum in August uh, up in up at MIT Lincoln Labs. And after the presentation, several people came up to me and said, "That was great. It's only too it's too bad that only a few people who were here uh, actually physically at the conference were able to see it." 
and so uh, I'm taking this opportunity uh, to uh, service sort of both constituencies. First, for the people that that weren't at the DAF DAF, uh, they get an opportunity uh, uh, to have this discussion uh, to a wider audience. And secondly, for those who were at the DAF DAF, uh, I'm going to spice up the presentation a bit by adding a few additional uh, uh, tidbits that weren't there. Uh, first of all, we have more time in this discussion today than we had during the keynote. And so I'm going to be able to go into more examples uh, and, and more, more detail in some areas, uh, as well as introducing some, some data that wasn't available at the time, namely uh, a brief discussion of the uh, DAF CIO strategy, as well as uh, a little deeper dive on zero trust and where we are with our major acquisition programs. And so um, this is going to be a, a fairly wide open discussion. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the, at the back. And I see the presentation itself as more of a cue for the, the conversation. Um, and so we have plenty of time. So I'm going to dive right in. And then um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll engage with the questions. So as, as, uh, as stated, uh, you know, feel free to put them in the chat. And some of them I may be able to engage uh, during the course of the presentation if I can do it in line, if they come in in time. Uh, others we will take in, in, in order when, when the, the main briefing is done. If we can do it in such a way that doesn't interrupt the flow, we will. Terrific. All right, so the, the, I titled this Modernizing Enterprise IT and Data because I want to make it very clear that these two things do not exist in isolation from each other. Uh, we, we talk a lot about data as the lifeblood of the enterprise, and it is, but that lifeblood moves through veins and arteries that are- uh, We have screen now. Excellent. Modernizing enterprise IT and data in the yeah. That's it. Okay, terrific, great. Game on. All right, I will talk to that. So, um, as I was saying, the, the connection between these two things is, is tight and interlocked. And so we need to understand one in reference to the other. And so as we look at uh, the work that needs to be done in order to modernize the architecture, we need to keep into account the fact that the, the thing that flows between all of our systems and applications is the data that's res that resides inside those systems and when we're looking at harmonizing our data, we also have to keep in mind that the systems that they reside in need to be updated in order to accommodate the changes that we're working to make. And when we get to the second half of the presentation, we'll talk about how that interrelationship exists no more strongly anywhere than, than it does in our zero trust relationship. Okay. So I will, there we go. I will, can you, have you seen the slides advance? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. good. All right, I don't want to have to check again. So, you know, uh, General Brown, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, uh, talks uh, often about the fact that uh, he believes there is no ceiling to what we can accomplish if we put our minds to it. And that we've done incredible things in the Department of the Air Force and in the U.S. Air Force in, as, in particular as well, um, when we have been able to focus innovative minds on solving difficult problems. But it seems sometimes that difficult problems are, are not our issue. <laughs> we can solve the hard problems, but we make the really easy things really hard. And I think sometimes that's because we have a, an organization that was established for the purpose of solving hard problems, right? We were designed to be innovative and inventing new capabilities, whether they be airframes or spacecraft doing things that never had been done before. And it's been phenomenally successful, perhaps one of the most successful organizations in the history of the world at innovating for intent, innovating for mission success. The problem is that an organization that is oriented in that direction towards that end trips over itself sometimes when it comes to doing things that are more established and understood. It's counterintuitive, but you can understand why. A Formula One race car may not be the most vehicle to drive, most, most efficient vehicle to drive to the corner grocery store to get a quart of milk. In the same way, uh, an organization focused on inventing things may not be the most efficient approach 
to doing commodity activity that at TRL nine, things where uh, we are working state of practice instead of state of the art. So how can we find a way to change faster? We first thing we have to do is understand the problem that we face. So this is a montage of pictures that talk about how that era of amazing innovation and success uh, came about, right? You've got everything from air traffic control to satellite control stations to uh, design for purpose mainframes assembled into racks of hardware and deployable capabilities on the bottom right. All of it invented fit for purpose, customized as needed to accomplish a mission. And we were the best in the world at doing so. And we oriented our acquisition processes and our data management processes around the notion that we were inventing it from scratch. And all this tends to be custom hardware running custom software. And we built our acquisition strategy in a way that would be most optimized for doing things for the first time ever. The problem we find is that over time, the US military in general and the Air Force in specific no longer had to invent all of the components that it needed to do its mission. And we started to use more and more commodity hardware and then over time, eventually commodity software to take over those things that, had, that were performed better by, by industry, by the commercial world uh, so that we didn't have to worry about that. I contend that the way we got ourselves to the tremendous success of our past is not the way that we will acquire and integrate data and IT in the future and not the way we should be doing it today. If I have to invent something, I control the process end to end. If I'm integrating commodity hardware and running commodity software on it, I don't. I don't have to and I shouldn't. But yet our acquisition processes have not changed from when we did. So I believe that if we are in a world where in our middle screen, all of those computers and much of the software on those computers could be purchased at a, a Best Buy, that we should account for that advantage and modify our processes accordingly. If our communications link can be connected through a Starlink terminal that we didn't have to build, we bought as a service, we should account for that in our design. If we can store and process data in a cloud environment that ensures the security of our data and patches and updates it much faster centrally than we ever could by making those same improvements on a base by base basis and trying to find a way to coordinate it all in time and space, then we should, we should allow them to do that. And the same is true for our deployable capabilities. If I can simply assemble commodity hardware and software with a little bit of special sauce, which oftentimes tends to be our data, then we should. We should take advantage of that both in how we, in what we buy and in how we buy it. So we find ourselves in a world where we are burdened by the classic uh, success dilemma. The work that we've done in the past allowed us to be very successful as a Air Force and Space Force. But it isn't going to get us to where we need to be in the future, largely because its legacy, hardware and software that's aging out. Over time, its maintenance costs have continued to go up. And many times we can't even find the parts anymore. Cybersecurity was not a factor in most cases when those systems were developed. And so imposing a security paradigm on, on them requires an additional level and layer of software on top of what the work was originally intended to do. If we want to move to the future state that we know we need to be in, we have two choices, two paths to take. The course of action one is on the top of this train. It's kind of what we've been doing for the past decade while we took a pause in our IT modernization. Because you know what? Our legacy systems were working, so why mess with it? We took a pause in modernization and we got behind on the uh, timelines of the data and systems that we use. So we could keep doing what we've been doing. We could patch and layer our cybersecurity on top of existing hardware and software while the sustainment cost goes up and up. We could continue to proliferate legacy networks to connect point to point 
between uh, locations, between systems. We could keep building uh, enclaves for individual weapon systems uh, that require handshakes and interfaces and connections between them. And we could continue to experience the challenges that we face at the user level. It's the result of all of this, which is computers that are slow, not just because the computer itself is maybe old and overburdened, but because all of locations that they have to pull data from are suffering the same fate. The second course of action is to leapfrog over the two generations of IT uh, that we've skipped and transform as the path to modernization. That course of action gives us this modern cybersecurity based upon commercial speed patch uh, architectures and sophisticated design for purpose cybersecurity systems with, that enable that use automation to track threats as they emerge and where they might be appear, they might appear that uses strong logging to make sure we understand where adversaries have been able to hit our network. It, it, it also gives you a strong linkage between our weapon systems and our enterprise network. You know, today our weapon systems live on separate enclaves as I mentioned earlier. And then in addition to that, we also have an enterprise network and what we use to do business functions and enterprise email and the like. By integrating the two of them, we can realize the goal of closing kill chains at machine speed, at accelerating our command and control and battle management capability, which is one of the key goals of the ABMS program. And we can ensure that our users, the day-to-day -day, uh, users of our systems experience responsive networks that provide the data they need quickly that allow them to integrate and innovate without facing the dilemma of the spinning blue wheel of death when they need uh, to get their work done. This responds to the fix my computer challenge of how can I be the most innovative service in the military if I can't even log on in, in under 15 minutes. So I'm here to tell you we have chosen COA2 as the path it depends upon a number of key enablers, but I'll tell you, technology is not one of them. This is solved science. The technology to do this exists and it has been in use in industry for a decade and it's been in use around much of the rest of the federal government for a long time as well. We just have to grab the ring and hang on. Now to achieve this goal, the CIO has recently published a DAF strategy, CIO strategy. This is a really quick overview of the components of that strategy that outlines how we're going to achieve the mission and vision on the right. There are six lines of effort that we will use to deliver against this vision. We'll, we'll talk a little more about uh, accelerating cloud adoption. And all this, by the way, is available on the website for you to read. Um, we'll talk about what we need to do to get true innovative future cybersecurity capability. Uh, that's, we talked a little bit about that today, but uh, more will be uh, available there as well. We talked about what we need to upgun the workforce we because we have not been training people for the technologies and tools of the future. We've been teaching them what we, what we have today. And, and we know that we're gonna have to skate to where the puck is going to be on our, um, on our workforce and our training. LOE4, uh, goes after portfolio management. It promotes the notion that our I, for our, our IT enterprise IT to be successful, we can't just worry about the content inside the teeny tiny EIT portfolio. That we have to extend that governance to cover all of the IT built around the department, to include all of the enterprise applications, mission specific applications, weapon system IT and the like in order to be able to, to get the full benefit of the standards based approach that we are pursuing. LOE5 talks about how we can do the basic blocking and tackling of IT more effectively and provide people the tools they need to get their jobs done in each of the main 
portfolio areas. And then LOE6, uh, near and dear to this group's heart, is focused on data and AI. How do I make, make data a strategic asset and not just something trapped and locked inside mission-specific applications? So we'll touch on different parts of this as we go through the rest of the presentation, but I encourage everyone to read the full document online to get a sense of how this all interrelates. The next chart is my, is my favorite little pyramid, and it shows uh, the technology stack that uh, we know we need to use. It's notional in that we all use this every day, but we tend to use it in enclaves. We tend to, do, to go up and down this stack uh, one application at a time or one mission specific area at a time. And what the, what the DAF CIO has made clear is that we want to move to a world where instead of having everybody with a new idea having to go out and build their own stack in order to implement that idea, that they can simply leverage the enterprise stack to accomplish that. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna show you a pretty busy picture next. And we're just gonna, gonna sort of walk through this progression in time. So prior to just a few years ago, if you wanted to build a new application, you had to build your own stack. It was particularly difficult to leverage an existing data center, for example, in order to deliver a new application. But if you could work a deal, you could get it done. Most programs, however, didn't bother to do that. Instead, what they would do is just sort of shrink wrap a new, uh, a couple of racks of hardware and deliver it to a comm squadron and, uh, and when they were delivering a weapon system onto a base. And they would drop it off at the doorstop, at the door of the comm squadron in the same way that a, um, a, a, uh, a, a, a basically an unwanted infant would be dropped off at the door of a fire station. When you do that over and over again, what you get is this proliferation of single purpose silos that then have to be maintained in perpetuity for the life of the program. But think about how we fund these programs. We fund weapon systems for acquisition and procurement. And then once they are built, they are left to the O&M world to maintain. In that world, no program is going to spend a dollar of additional resource to design for sustainability. And so they will often choose the, the cheapest and easiest path. Now, you guys probably already know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna ask anyway, and I'm gonna ask you to put it up on the chat, which I realize that when I'm presenting, I can't, oops, I can't see the chat. So I'm gonna to have to ask someone else to um, keep track of this and shout out for me. Yes, sir, will do. Okay, and the question is this, given that environment that I just described where each weapon system deploys its own separate data center to a base for a capability, how many data centers do we think there are in the Department of the Air Force? I'm gonna give people a couple seconds to type their guess in. How many, and by the way, if you heard me give this speech before, you're not allowed to guess. Oh, I found so, out a way. Okay. So I found out a way. 1,800, as many as there are bases, 1,750, 900, 950, 3,000. Okay. So there are a couple of folks who have heard this before, but, or who maybe know the right answer for other reasons. But yeah, the answer is we have, a, we have 185 bases, but we have 1,000 data centers. Now that ranges from everything from an enterprise scalable data center that takes up a whole building uh, to a couple of racks in a closet somewhere. But all of them have to be maintained. All of them have to have their software kept up to date. They need to be patched. Uh, they need to consume power. They require cooling um, and they need to be recapped over time. This chart on the left-hand side shows the net effect of that over time when you allow those, those uh, data centers to proliferate because everything has to hold a separate application. So we looked at this about five years ago. We said, this is not 
this doesn't scale, right? This is not going to be uh, sustainable into the future. We have to find a way to fix this. And so we said, well, one way to do that is to build an enterprise stack so that we don't need everybody to build their own transport layer, their own compute and store layer, their own data layer, their own collaboration tools. And then on top of that, finally, when they mount that summit, are they able to start building their emission application? And then what we would, and that's what that middle part of the picture shows. Build a foundational enterprise stack so that folks can put their new applications on top, which allows a, a person with a good idea to simply worry about building only the piece they know and understand best, the mission specific application that needs to sit on top of that architecture. But of course, we've got a lot of installed plant, right? We've got a lot of existing systems. And so in addition to a home for new applications, we also have to have a conveyor belt that allows us to rationalize and migrate existing applications into this environment. So this is the process known as cloud migration. And it's something that's going on right now across government and across industry all around the world, taking things out of on-premise server rooms and putting them into the cloud so that they can be scalable globally. And different people are having different levels of success in this endeavor. The Air Force is struggling a bit on this because we have a limited ingest rate into our cloud environment because of funding restrictions, which have been alleviated in this year's budget, I'm glad to say. Uh, but we also have a lot of legacy platforms that are very expensive to move. Now, I will also highlight here that moving this data into the cloud by itself does not integrate its data fully into one of our six enterprise data platforms. It provides the opportunity to do that, but many of the data systems, data heavy systems that are moving into the cloud right now are being rationalized and they're lifting and shifting from their on-premise data center into the cloud without any uh, work going on to remove that data from the platform and put it, put it into a shared data lake. There are efforts underway to make copies of that data and put it into uh, a shared enterprise data fabric, uh, but we're not at the point yet where we can relieve that application of the requirement to hold on to its data as a system of record. That's work to be done. But we can at least migrate the system into the enterprise stack and get rid of all those silo stacks that live all over the department. And that's the work that's underway right now. And in that middle chart, you see areas that are starting to go gray, meaning we've been able to pull an application out of an on-premise location, put it into the cloud and make it accessible to everybody. So where is this headed? Well, we're headed into a world on the right where the majority of our data systems sit on top of a robust enterprise stack, that they're accessible to users via mission specific applications, which over time themselves need to get rationalized and combined, right? There's probably, you know, we don't want, we don't necessarily need to have five different PCS applications. We probably should consolidate those. Same with all the personnel systems, the, the my vectors, the my all, all that stuff needs to be consolidated and rationalized as well, but th as well, but those are those are functional responsibilities. We still think we're going to have some number of on-premise locations because of uh, variations in security levels, the things that we need to do with foreign partners, uh, and the things that we do to support combatant commands. So we never expect that there's going to be a hundred percent migration to the cloud. There's some some functions don't make sense to do it that way. When I say compute and store layer, I don't just mean cloud. I also mean enterprise data centers that are um, uh, scalable and efficient as well. Uh, for example, I don't think we want to take all of our full motion video exploitation off of uh, UAVs and move that to the cloud. The costs alone uh, would be prohibitive and that data tends to be ephemeral uh, temporally. And so we want to make sure we're smart about how we manage this data and what we put into mission specific applications and data centers versus what we move to the cloud. But in, but in general, this process of eliminating uh, standalone stacks in favor of consolidated stacks will both uh, ease our efforts at data integration and reduce our O&M expenditures locally. 
with the intent of unlocking that uh, inefficiently spent capital and reallocating it towards modernization. So I firmly believe that the, the resources that we need to modernize our, our IT infrastructure and modernize our data fabrics is here. It's being spent now. It's just locked into sustainment of hundreds of redundant separate standalone systems. And that if we could realize the economies of scale associated with consolidation, we unlock that resource, we extract it out of the shale rock that it's locked into and utilize it to modernize and improve our cybersecurity. Okay, that's a lot on this one slide, but it's, there's a lot here. So I've got a couple of use cases here that illustrate what I'm talking about, right? And, I, and we'll just talk, about, I've, I've already kind of talked about the data center one. The fact that we have multiple and disparate data centers, which means we have to have multiple copies of the same application in multiple places and multiple copies of the same data in multiple places that have, all of which have to be maintained and kept up to date and then synchronized with the data held everywhere else. It's a huge pile of work and it's one that consumes an awful lot of people's time. But it's not just the data center piece that this affects. It affects major weapon systems programs like the F-35 program. And we know that the majority of the cost of that program, like all major weapon systems, is on sustainment, not on the initial procurement. But if our incentive structure is lined up so that they optimize for the initial procurement cost, then our cost down the road will get even higher than what is projected. So we got to find a way to add some incentives into the system so that sustainment is a factor in design. Similarly, we're looking at, at consolidating our legacy systems and platforms. And that requires looking at existing, not just new things that we're delivering in this environment, but existing legacy systems and finding ways to operate more, more, more smartly when we sustain and maintain these systems and get rid of some of them that don't have a need for a long-term life pattern. The cost, for example, of, 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 migrate, of, of rationalizing and migrating applications that are at the end of life uh, probably doesn't, isn't justified uh, if we, we intend on getting rid of them soon. So all of this has to be taken into account into our sustainment strategy. Now, we're doing this all for a reason. And we're doing it because these major portfolios of IT support the mission of the Department of the Air Force. And if I look at what our, uh, one of our flagship weapon systems, and I'll use the example here of ABMS, needs to do, it dovetails very nicely with what the, um, the ABMS uh, what system needs out of our enterprise IT. So for example, our major portfolios, compute and store, connect, end user devices, enterprise services, and protect running across the gamut of all of them, maps up very nicely to the core principles of secure processing, connectivity, effects integration, and ways of working, which tells how things get done. Those are coming straight from the ABMS office. So if our goal here is to ensure that enterprise IT delivers the rock solid digital foundation that systems, mission systems like ABMS needs in order to accomplish its mission, uh, then we, we can stay aligned and, and really accelerate the timelines for those transformations and reduce the cost of doing so, and of duplication of effort. So this is a chart that comes straight from ABMS and JADC2. It talks about how uh, our, our, our goal for future command and control is envisioned through ABMS. And some of these terms are are uh, maybe a little bit out of date and we're not necessarily using all of them of the ones uh, that you see on the list, but the, everything you see here in blue is part of the vision of ABMS. But you can see, and everything in yellow talks about the, the, the services that are being delivered by enterprise IT. But as you can see, there's many, many areas where these two touch each other. And we fully expect that in some cases, enterprise IT already delivers a capability that will simply be consumed by ABMS and other users of JADC2. Similarly, 
ABMS digital infrastructure program is going to deliver some capabilities. And I'll talk about, you know, our, our, our edge capabilities in particular that will then be absorbed by the enterprise and made available for other mission systems as well. And so it's a very symbiotic relationship between the two. We believe that ABMS has to ride upon the enterprise IT backbone and that enterprise IT can deliver a foundation upon which their digital infrastructure endeavor can build. Now, we also know that uh, we don't necessarily fight wars on the unclassified side. We tend to do that at the secret level and higher. And so when we look at uh, the modernization that's required on the secret level fabric, it's helpful to compare it to what we have today. And I like to say to people, you know, we talk about Cipernet all the time, but there's really no such thing as Cipernet, right? There's a secret level fabric that DISA provides. And then there's a whole lot of octopus arms that come out of that centralized service to feed individual enclave networks that are, that are mission or location specific. So you'll have a network at a COCOM, you'll have a network at a, at a, at a weapon system program office that's managed to, to uh, handle a single system or a single mission, regional mission. But all the connections between them have to go back through that disaccord in order to communicate to another. And the belief here is that that's not perhaps the most efficient way to manage a battle management command and control system that is endeavoring to close thousands of kill chains in milliseconds. And so as we look at what Cipper 2.0 might look like, uh, there's a few key principles we want to keep in mind. Uh, first, we want to find a way to leverage Cipper or DISA's services without necessarily having to transit DISA's network. And so creating a, a set of standards that lives upon a standard uh, security stack, but that allows a network to extend beyond that so that uh, all of those other programs can talk to each other without having to go back through DISA is key. Second, I want to break open the enclaves and say, if you're going to ride upon the enterprise network, you don't need to have your own enclave. You can live on the base uh, AFNET S on the Cipernet fabric inside the uh, Department of the Air Force's uh, architecture and eliminate all of those separate enclave boundaries, right? So if we're going to use uh, apply things like zero trust to the at the network level, we're going to do that at Cipper as well. Then that means you don't necessarily have to have a moat and a fortress wall around your individual program's capability. I believe that uh, this will accelerate the timelines for connecting up those weapon systems, allowing them to share data much more easily. And this work is underway to define what Cipernet 2.0 is going to look like, but it, it kind of builds upon those core principles. Okay, All, we've been we've been uh, referring to this in several different places. And I'm not going to brief the data crew on what their data plan is. But I, I will tell you this. Uh, right now, the data in the Department of the Air Force lives inside, embedded within, locked within the individual platforms and applications which uh, operate upon that data. And that when another application needs your data, you have to build an interface, whether it's an API or a hard-coded interface, which uh, exchanges that data. And then once it's transmitted to the other system, then it has to be maintained within that system. And there has to be some way to synchronize it so that when there's changes, the changes propagate through multiple other systems. And depending upon how many trading partners a given data system might have, that might be an awful lot of interfaces that you have to keep in sync. And you have to put all the appropriate protections, whether it's privacy or uh, anything else upon that data to ensure that it's protected at the appropriate level and that only the people with the right authorities to access it can do so. That's a tremendously complex problem when you have hundreds of systems of record that are authorized to hold this data. The Chief Data and AI Office is about the business of identifying our data holdings, rationalizing those data holdings, and migrating to a system of a much smaller number of data platforms which have capabilities to 
track and tag that data, log changes to it, and then feed that, beta, that data to and from the application systems that need to use it. They act as a data lake that will store that data, but store it once so that you don't have 11 different records with Winston Beauchamp's name on it for personnel actions, for security, for pay, for logistics, and the like, all of which have duplicative data and all of which, if any one of them is spelled wrong, you know, uh, heaven forfend if I try to go and access my own data. So we want to rationalize that data so that it's listed in a coherent way, that it's not duplicative and it's not subject to the same level of human error as hand jammed redundant systems are. And they've rationalized that architecture, that data fabric down to six uh, uh, flagship systems. And they're listed there on the right, each of which has a specialty area, uh, but which are which have some of the same core competencies in terms of being able to track the data. And that activity, even to date, for those systems that have migrated their data into, into uh, Vault or one of the other uh, core systems, have already shown significant improvements in efficiencies and timelines. And you see those on the left. We are uh, continuing to accelerate our ability to migrate this data, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done and not enough resource to do it. And so we need to enlist the help of program owners in order to be able to take the initiative to migrate their own data and not wait for uh, CDAO to come in and, and, and do it for you. That work is ongoing, uh, but it's going to be a tough slog when you get through hundreds and hundreds of systems of record. So we've already talked about the advantages associated with that. Here are some statistics on what that has, what that progress has been to date. And we measure the progress in a number of different ways. Uh, one way to look at it is uh, the degree to which the data connections have been established between these systems. And the numbers that are shown on the right hand side of this chart describe the number of data connections and feeds that are coming in into Envision, Elixir, UDL, Vault and Blade, uh, and the other systems that we use and the tools that are listed to, that help enable those data connections and feeds. So this is actively underway today. Uh, and if you are responsible for a system of record um, and you're not having a conversation about how you're going to rationalize and centralize your data, and feed this into one of the systems of records you, we, should, we should be. So I wanna talk a little bit about RPA as an enabler of data and AI. It's sort of on the, on the low end of artificial intelligence. RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation. Uh, think of it as a way that you could take what is today a, um, a repeatable but manual process and automate it to the extent that you can follow your keystrokes or mouse clicks so that you don't have to then manually do it all yourself. You can train the system to do a certain transform, whether it's taking a sheet of numbers, manipulating them in some way and putting them in a spreadsheet over here. If it's something you do every day, it's something that takes a certain amount of your time. You can train the system by doing it while it's watching you. You can account for any anomaly situations that as they arise, and then you can put it into a position to then do it automatically from that point on when you feed it the input conditions. And this, uh, this, this RPA approach that we've taken has been used in uh, a number of different areas. There's some examples that are shown here on the bottom of this screen. I've been able to talk to some of the folks who have been employing this across their job and they talk about the just hundreds of hours uh, per application, per, per job that this uh, has been able to save. And what it really does is it allows people to get rid of some of the mundane parts of their work so they can spend more time on the things that require judgment and, 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 and active thought. Uh, investment in RPA uh, has, a, has, has, has a great ROI. And as you can see, We've already experienced quite a bit of that today and there's more to be done. We have an enterprise license right now on a system called UiPath that helps you design and build your robotic approach, your robots to get this work done for you. 
and uh, and I encourage you to explore them if you haven't uh, been able to do so today and your job uh, includes some of these um, types of mundane activities during the day. Here's another great example uh, about the uh, Air Force's uh, weather system. So uh, everybody knows that we have radars uh, that help us to uh, measure weather, and then we use that information when designing flight routes and planning missions. Uh, but what we may not know is that there's parts of the world where we don't have the data that we need to get the job done. And so in the past, that meant we had blank spots or we had a great deal of, uh, of manual intervention by meteorologists to figure out what to do about those blank spots. What, the, um, what this deep learning capability has done is it allowed us to uh, uh, identify the relationship between different types of sensor data that we collect already and say, hmm, I know that when the weather data says this and the model says that and the satellite imagery looks like this, and there's a certain lightning pattern associated with these storms. I don't want to fly into lightning. So I can predict where the lightning is going to be. And even if I don't have a sensor there, I can interpolate and fill in the blanks on the data that I have that I use for mission planning. And the result of this has been basically critical data for mission planning purposes that we would not otherwise have. That has been very well correlated with actual data that when they've compared it to the model and when they've compared it to reality. And so this is just one example, but it's an area where artificial intelligence can help us in ways that, you know, it would take many, many people in a room to figure this out, and it wouldn't be nearly as timely as if you use the appropriate tools to get this work done. All it takes is some innovative folks to set it up and uh, to make sure you feed it with the, uh, the right amount of, of data, in this case, sensor data, because data is the lifeblood of AI and then bounce it against the algorithms that define those relationships so that you can make the predictions that you need. And here's an example of that, uh, where as a set of some thunderstorms are passing through uh, the, the, the Philippines, you were able to derive environmental data from all the sensor information that we collected to figure out what areas we needed to avoid based upon those storms. And uh, it correlated very well with the actual data uh, collected here. OK, so we talked a little about Cloud One. We even talked about it in the context of one of the uh, objectives of, uh, of the CIO strategy. And you know, Cloud One has been around for a while. It had a little bit of a rocky start because when we let these contracts to hyperscale cloud providers, we didn't fully resource the program. And so as a result, it took time for us to get it to the full set of capabilities, both in terms of being at multiple security levels, uh, having the right security architecture built in, uh, and having a development environment. And during that time, uh, folks were continuing to build their own standalone data storage and processing capabilities. And so we are now at a place where we have to sort of back out of that standalone capability, where folks either built their own data centers or built in some cases uh, uh, acquired their own cloud contracts and migrate that stuff into cloud one now that we have the Department of Defense's most comprehensive uh, cloud architecture. And you can see here <clears throat> the security architecture and the ability to protect and defend systems that are in the cloud up at the top part of the architecture. You see the size of the deployment uh, across both AWS and Azure uh, cloud instantiations uh, by um, physical location as well as you know, just sheer number of deployments. And then also by the number of terabytes of data stored. And how we've been able to respond to requests for that data by, by, by week, by day, and also by, by country around the world. The locations here, uh, their, their physical locations are because that's where the, the American bases are. It's not that we're getting uh, hit by people uh, from Qatar. It's that we've, that's where the US bases are that are accessing that data. So Cloud One is open for business. It is up and running. It is able to provide a, uh, a very safe, secure architecture for storing and processing your data. There's a, uh, a cloud mandate that says if you're building a new system, uh, you've got to consider using Cloud One first. 
before you build a standalone capability. And if you can't, you got to come in and talk to us and tell us why. Platform one is a DevSecOps capability. Uh, it is also the flagship uh, DevSecOps platform for the entire Department of Defense. And it's one, uh, you know, get since um, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery, it's one that's been replicated across DOD, both inside the Air Force and across the other services as well. And this particular stack is one that has uh, been optimized for multiple ways of doing business with uh, within the Air Force. So we have everything from major acquisition programs employing uh, Platform One for DevSecOps, as well as um, uh, much smaller deployments of individual applications and tools. Uh, accompanying side by side with Platform One are special purpose DevSecOps capabilities like Kessel Run and Kobayashi Maru, who are doing similar work, but focused on a specific mission, doing many of the same things. Uh, I will point out that um, Platform One is home to our CNAP capabilities, which is Cloud Native Access Point, a, 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 a very important component of our zero trust pilot inside the Air Force. Uh, and they have been able to put it through its paces at multiple security levels. You see there IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, and the number of IPs that are resident on CNAP uh, so that we can ensure that we've tested it appropriately. Uh, as we go forward with zero trust and we'll talk about that more in a minute and here we are with zero trust so um i've been asked multiple times you know hey i keep hearing this buzzword of zero trust what does it really mean to us in in real life so uh, i'll lay out the layman's definition and then we'll talk about what it means in the department of the air force so a traditional security architecture you know everybody knows that the that the core pieces of the internet were not built with security in mind, right? Uh, the HTTP protocols uh, and uh, the way a domain name server is set up and all FTP, all of the main building blocks of the internet were built for collaboration, right? They're built for academic and, and research purposes without a thought to, you know, someone could use this for malicious purposes. Um, and so the security architectures have largely been imposed upon uh, that from from uh, as another layer on top of the way IT is built. Now, what that's traditionally meant is building some sort of a boundary or gateway to get into a network from the internet that uh, checks to make sure you you are who you say you are, but that once you're in, you're in, right? Uh, you think of it as a a walled city with a gate. And a guard at the gate checks your ID and says, yep, you look good. All right, get on inside, right? Uh, another way to think of it is like uh, airport security, right? Once you're through airport security, you can kind of do whatever you want and go wherever you want within limits uh, inside uh, the back end of the airport past security. The challenge with that is that um, bad actors have taken, first of all, they've had the ability to replicate credentials so they can get in. And secondly, um, uh, folks who uh, may, may, uh, may be who they say they are, but might pose an insider threat, have been able to move around inside behind that, uh, that wall and do some not so great things, uh, whether it's um, causing damage or stealing data. And so the concept of zero trust uh, evolved as a way to counter that threat. What it basically says is, you know, fine, you can have a boundary, but um, just because you're in doesn't mean you are trusted from that point on. The concept of zero trust is that you need to demonstrate who you are and why you have a need to access any particular data holding as it lives, right? Instead of just you know getting through the, the outer boundary, you have to prove who you are every time you go to a, uh, a house in that city, in that walled city, uh, to make sure you can get in the front door, right? So instead Instead of a, a walled city with all the doors and windows open, this has locks uh, everywhere and one where you use your, your, uh, your cat card, if you will, uh, to get into each individual building. So this concept um, also includes uh, a couple of, of, of core principles. One, it requires you to have very strong identity credentialing and access management. 
So I need to know exactly who you are. That means I can't have multiple uh, personas on the network. I have to, it has to resolve to one person. And it also has to have a way to handle non-person uh, uh, personas, right? So these are identities that are representing machines or bots that are doing work on your behalf. So I, I can't have duplicates and I can't have shared credentials. I can't have a administrator login where the password is administrator. Uh, I have to I have to know who is who is doing what when, and it relies upon very strong logging of a person's activity. Now you still have to have a boundary. The boundary is different than the past, and that's where we talked about that uh, zero trust gateway, as represented in the pilot by CNAP, as a way to ensure that we understand that you are who you say you are. And the third piece is I need to make sure that the data that sits in my systems. If I'm gonna focus on the systems and applications where the data lives, instead of the network that it rides on as the focus of my protection, then I have to have very good um, ICAM uh, checking at the entry point of an application. And I have to tag my data so that I know exactly what types of people and entities are allowed to access my data and under what conditions. So when you take those pieces and put them together, you uh, wind up with an architecture that provides a significant elevated cost to an adversary in order to try to get in and disrupt what we're doing um, and a much more resilient architecture, right? Because if you're, if you're not trusting things just because they're in, um, I have to now establish myself in my credentials inside every separate application, that, that's a much higher cost to an adversary and it limits the damage they can occur. They can incur once they're in there. Okay. So at the, at the highest level, that's really the idea behind zero trust. So when we are talking about delivering this into the Department of the Air Force, um, we, we talked about the, the boundary. In this case, we'll call it SAZI. And I see there is, a, there is a question in the chat based upon this that we can talk about here. Um, if, if my strategy includes secure access service edge, then that means I'm employing my gateway as a filter for all of the sources of data coming in. I, if, I, if I can align my user to what he is he's allowed to do, what his identity is and what his role allows him to do, well, that means he can access that data store in the center, but not the ones on the left and the right, right? So I have an ability to tell both on the persona side as well as on the data holding side and the gateway being the adjudicator for that, I can tell whether or not that person is allowed in to get access to that data. That's the, that's the north-south security mechanism, right? Then on meaning getting into our architecture. The idea on the right, again, same layers that we're employing here is we're using what's called micro segmentation. Uh, that means we're taking the, um, the access permissions that previously were at the system level and subdividing it into many, many slices so that I know exactly what somebody with this role is able to access and what able, they're able to do with that data once they access it. So you can imagine that somebody who is a regular user on a data system might be able to read data, but not necessarily change it. Or they might be able to read all the data, but only change their own data. Or they might be able to read some data based upon their role. Whereas an administrator might be able to do more, but even the administrator would have a limit would have limits on what they can access. Today, a lot of administrators can do whatever they want, and there's not really a lot of constraints on their action, and there may not always be a lot of monitoring of it either. But part of zero trust, part of micro segmentation, is ensuring that 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 is monitored. That the the roles are sliced up, and the data is sliced up so that people can only operate upon the things that they need to do their job and not just because they get in. That's what limits uh, the ability to um, move laterally within a network once an adversary gets in because the persona that they steal or, or copy or clone uh, is only gonna, is gonna be limited to the roles that, uh, that lines up to what, it, what it's supposed to be able to do. Right now, a lot of uh, attack vectors, uh, threat actors will attempt wherever they can to steal administrator certificates, because if they do, that's like the golden ticket, right? It gives them access to a lot of things. What we're uh, about is ensuring that that, that that role does not exist in the future, that people are limited in what they can do. 
Okay. So we talked before about the fact that one of the one of the core elements of our strategy is is getting our, our future workforce up to the point of being able to uh, handle all of these new concepts and technologies going forward. We know that we're going to have a very different workforce in five years um, and that their jobs we're going to ask them to do are very different. If somebody at a comm squadron today, their job is swapping out hard drives. As we implement uh, ITAS, uh, we are going to be uh, outsourcing much of the commodity IT work. Because first of all, some you know those hard drives may not be local anymore. They might be in the cloud. And second of all, we're going to be able to upgun the work that that young airman is doing to maintain uh, uh, that system. They're now going to have to have, uh, maybe they'll be responsible for mission defense. Maybe they'll be responsible for managing a team of contractors doing the work they were doing before. Uh, it'll be different in every case, but we do know that we need to ensure that we provide access to the skills of the future. One way to do that is through something called digital university. It's a suite of online courses that are available in everything from web development to uh, to system maintenance, to cybersecurity, so that folks can understand what the technologies of the future look like and how they need to respond to change their jobs. And uh, it is something that is available to everybody. Uh, it's one that is, is free to the individuals and it, uh, it, it is very easy to navigate. And so I encourage folks to use it if they haven't already, the, uh, the address is down at the bottom, even if it's just to take a look at what opportunities are available to them so they can get a sense of what skills they might want to, to join, take some classes, get a feeling for what's there and see if it's right for you. So we know that this is not going to be something that happens overnight. The vision that we've laid out here is a fairly sweeping uh, change over the way we do things today. And so we have a fairly repeatable process to figure out how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be in the future, right? We got to figure out what is what is the gap we're trying to fill. We have to then build a roadmap that gets us there. And if, if there's some risk or uncertainty, we might run a pilot to test it out. Translate that into an acquisition program that then has to be developed and then fielded and then sustained. All this with sustainment in mind so that we can reduce our, our O&M cost over time. And as you can see, there's, there's roadmaps are in work right now in each of these areas down below and the different levels of maturity in terms of, uh, of where they are. Uh, you can see some of them are fairly well advanced and others are, are still in the, in the earlier stages. But this is the approach that we're going to do to define what our end state looks like and then iterate back on, on what needs to get done. And so I think I'm gonna stop it here uh, so that I can start to get to some of your questions and uh, address and address them as we go. Uh, my hope is that this little overview has uh, given you a good view on what our approach is to modernization inside uh, the the Department of the Air Force. And for and with that, I will I will go take a look at your questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beauchamp, for that very thought provoking outlook and laying out. What, what I see is the course of how we'll realize the EIT and zero trust capabilities, particularly the data requirements and the digital workforce that's necessary to compete, deter, and if necessary, win in a peer near peer conflict within the 21st century. As you alluded to, we do have questions in the chat and I invite uh, uh, those that haven't had a chance to ask yet to absolutely uh, plug in your questions and, and we'll read those aloud. And uh, so I will start off with the first question, which comes from Ahmed, and uh, sir, you're still sharing your screen as well, just uh, FYI. Um, so Ahmed, I said with 43% of all, sorry, busy office, with 43% of all business devices still unable to upgrade to Windows 11 because of hardware requirements imposed by TPM 2.0, May I kindly ask you to comment on the impact and opportunity from a security perspective? Similarly, for uh, confidential compute, AKA encryption and use, how may this impact the acquisition process? Okay, let me see if I understand. Uh, let's take them one at a time. Uh, so yes, it is true. There are requirements uh, on our, when I say business devices here, we mean end user devices, largely laptops that are unable to upgrade to Windows 11. And uh, we undertook an effort in FY22 uh, to buy 200,000 
new laptops that were Windows 11 compliant. Uh, many of these were, our, were part of our recap cycle anyway, but they had maybe been stretched a bit by uh, the local uh, authorities. You know, recap of end user devices is a um, is a local responsibility, and so we uh, but we we invested some significant resources in accelerating uh, that process to ensure that we could get there uh, by the time we need to for a Windows 11 migration. Uh, we have similar investments in FY23. And so I, I think we'll get there uh, in the timeframe that we have. We actually started at a better place than some of the other services did with respect to the amount of money that we're spending. So uh, uh, I think we're on a, on a kind path. Uh, um, the, the, the impact of this and the opportunity from a security perspective is, well, I also wanna talk about it from a performance perspective because many of those older devices which were not, which are not uh, uh, able to be upgraded to Windows 11, were also the ones that were causing the biggest performance impact. And so, uh, two pieces uh, affected that. First of all, there's the age of the device and the speed of the processor, but there's also the fact that we impose in our in our desktop image a, a security architecture, which um, includes elements that sort of contend with each other, some legacy systems that fight. Um, and so by uh, eliminating many of the group policy objects the, in, in the image, we are able to streamline it down to a much smaller number of rules they have to process. And we eliminated the contention between those security systems. Uh, a lot of which was causing, you know, 80, 90% utilization of the, of, the, of the processor right off the bat before we even asked it to do anything from a mission perspective. And so there's the, there is a significant performance impact of upgrading the system as well. Um, in terms, so so I, I don't think it's going to be a challenge to get there. I think it'll be it'll take some work, uh, it'll take some resources, but I think we're on a on a path there uh, from a from a security perspective. I, I don't I don't know what to say about um, confidential compute or encryption in use. I I I, I could talk to the difference between the encryption at rest and encryption uh, of data in motion, but I, I don't I don't know how to address that at the unclassified level here. Okay, we'll we'll give Mr. Uh, Ahmed maybe a chance to to expand on that in the chat function. Uh, the next question is from David Brewer, and I think I'll read his comment and then uh, the two questions he has at the end. So he says, with with Web 3.0, it will be powered by new technologies like blockchain, AI, and AI, and driven by the DoD demands for privacy control and immersive human human machine teaming. Web 3.0 leverages blockchain technology to reinvent the way we store and manage data over the internet, providing a universal state layer. So this first question is, have we considered how servers and networks, um, have we considered servers and networks as a combined issue? And have we considered how to evolve data transmission using blockchain, which creates trust in the data as a decentralized and distributed network of computers? Yeah, I, I, I so I, I understand the question. Um, I, I don't know that it is um, a settled issue that blockchain is the technology that will be used to create trust in the future. I think it is certainly a piece of the solution, but it is not one that we are going to predetermine the outcome of inside the DoD. So the expectation here is that um, you know, we are currently employing, um, migrating to the employment of zero trust as the, as the construct to uh, create trust in the data. Um, and there are, uh, there's a discussion about the role of blockchain in, in doing that to ensure data integrity uh, in a distributed network. There is, not yet consensus on the role that that performs. And so I think this is a watch and wait and continue to follow the research as it continues. Because uh, we're going to wind up using um, commercially available technologies to uh, protect the data integrity. And I, so we're not going to get out in front of that from a DoD perspective. Uh, I think there's still some work to be done here uh, before we make a decision regarding how much of that of the blockchain work we're going to uh, employ inside DoD. Okay, thank you, sir. 
So the next question is from Ahmed as well. And I think you may have answered, it was uh, pertaining to slide 10. He says, how are multiple copies of the same data synchronized, if at all? Where is the single source of truth and how is that maintained? Yeah, yeah. So I think we did talk a little bit about this. The problem is they aren't, or if they are, it's brute force synchronization, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna physically transmit copies of the data to my trading partners. And uh, when, when th something changes, I'm gonna resend it all out. The, the intent is to get to a place where we have a, uh, a single authoritative source yes, and, allow, and allow multiple applications to access that authoritative source and that those applications will have uh, the ability to update that data for the parts of that data that they are responsible for. Uh, and that way we'll maintain that synchronization because it'll all be pointing to the same location. So a series of pointers instead of a, uh, uh, a, a bunch of copies that have to remain synchronized. Yes, sir, you hit it on the head, authoritative data sources. And that's something that we're working on as the CDAO to, uh, to help establish and recognize and, and ensure that we're pointing to the right source uh, for the use case or problems that you're working. Okay, this next one is from Emil Philcorn. He says, how can, this is in relation to slide 22, how can industry partners help bring capability to some of the focus areas like ICAM, Data Fabric, et cetera? Yeah, so th thanks for that question. You know, um, there, there's two ways to look at this uh, question and I'm only going to look at it the second way. A and it's this, if you are an industry partner who's working with one of our customers, whether it's a functional organization or a, uh, a mission organization, a weapon system builder and the like. And you are faced with a choice, uh, a fork in the road about whether to build a standalone capability inside the program or to leverage an Air Force Enterprise capability. There's some factors you need to consider. <clears throat> and I realize you're subject to the direction you get from your contracting officer and the program office, but you also have the ability to have a conversation with them to talk about these factors. And it's this, um, there is going to be a mandate on ICAM. There is going to be a mandate on the data fabric. Uh, and in several other areas we talked about for things like cl cloud and soon DevSecOps. And if the program is looking like it's going in another way, either because it doesn't understand or doesn't know about the enterprise approach, uh, you have an obligation to bring that to their attention so that not, not just for because to, to support us, but because you um, will have more flexibility and more resources available for the rest of the program, for the mission specific part of the program, if the infrastructure accommodates the enterprise. It will avoid rework. It will speed your authority to operate. It will um, greatly simplify your penetration testing and your uh, security checks, all, all the things that you have to do that, that where you have to come back to the enterprise hat in hand to say, are we, can we please be allowed to connect to the network? Uh, if you employ enterprise capabilities, many of which have those security layers already baked in that allow you to inherit uh, controls and security services, it greatly simplifies the process. And so it should be in your best interest to want to take advantage of those enterprise capabilities. And the best thing you can do if you're supporting one of those customers is to encourage them to employ enterprise capabilities to the maximum extent possible. Okay, the next question is from uh, Daniel Bradford. He says, under your platform one DevSecOps initiative, are you consolidating U US Air Force assets, i.e. people, software engineers and money at the enterprise level in one organization and providing a service or are you providing the enterprise capability and letting software organizations across the Air Force use it to build software? In other words, are you providing DevSecOps as a service for the Air Force or letting commands build software against your framework? Yeah, great question. The answer is both, right? So there is both a, a suite of services that you can mix and match and employ and use uh, uh, yourself, or you can bring the problem into platform one and have them do it as a service. Um, and th that's why you've got, you know, the, a lot of those uh, cute buzzwords on the chart between Iron Bank as a suite of, uh, of uh, containers worth of, of code 
that you can just, you know, plug and play, or you've got party bus where everybody can join in on your own and everything in between. Uh, and in addition to that, you also have, a, besides Platform One, we have a couple dozen other software factories that tend to be more single purpose built uh, for either uh, logistics or maintenance hardware or the like, uh, which are which are more focused on, which some of them take uh, some of that uh, customized capability from Platform One to just specialize it to one thing. Uh, the, the, the answer is both and uh, everything in between all along that continuum. Uh, I know it's, it, it's, uh, 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 it may seem weird, but the variety of missions that we have to perform in the Department of the Air Force is such that we really have to give people the opportunity to, to fit into, um, uh, into their mission space instead of trying to force fit them into what we provide. Okay, the next question is from uh, Ari Knausenberger. Rationalizing and migrating legacy enterprise mission and weapon systems requires an understanding of the baseline. Does the DAF have a, re a reliable up-to-date inventory of these systems, where they are hosted, what data they use in their tech stacks, et cetera? Yeah, that, that is a, uh, a great question. And the short answer is no. The better answer is yes, in certain functional areas, we have a very good uh, understanding of our systems. Uh, we are in the process working with our chief data and AI office inside CND to do the same thing for data. Um, but there are other mission areas where honestly, we don't have a good understanding at all. Our partners in SAFMG did a study a couple of years ago where they went through and cataloged all of the mission applications in the largest functional areas of the organization. So think uh, personnel, A1, uh, logistics and maintenance, A4, uh, financial management, FM, and acquisition, AQ. They, they account between them uh, for the lion's share of the functional applications in the Department of the Air Force. And they did an exhaustive assessment of all of the systems, legacy and, and, and shrink wrap software and the like that are being used to accomplish those missions. And they put a roadmap in place to migrate uh, them into uh, a consolidated number of those. Uh, unfortunately, the resourcing for that, uh, it was prohibitive, but pieces of that roadmap have been implemented. We need to do a similar thing um, on the weapon system side so that we can understand the amount of overlap and redundancy that we have across those mission areas, pick winners, and consolidate the resources being spent, and along the way, do the same for the data that they use. And we are just, we are, we are working on that piece, but we are still at the single digit percentage in terms of penetration. Okay, uh, the next question is from uh, Ahmed again. He says, you mentioned that the internet does not have identity. Do you see self-sovereign identity contributing to this role, if any? I don't think I said the internet doesn't have identity. I said that the internet wasn't designed for security. Um, it has pieces that allow for someone to identify themselves, but it, it, it's almost self-certified as, as you say here. Um, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the term self-sovereign identity, though, so I don't think I can speak um, intelligently about that. Yes, sir. Next question is from Paul Hayes. He says, Mr. Beauchamp, with respect to your COAs on modernizing, which is patching versus uh, leaping, one of the biggest challenges with resourcing the leap is that you have to have money to fund both legacy and modernize EIT until the modernized EIT is mission capable. Money, of course, is hard to come by now, but are there efforts to address this bump in resource need to make that leap? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. And you're absolutely right. This was the challenge for us. Uh, last year, we attempted to do this, <clears throat> uh, at least for the data center piece, through a program called Domino. Project Domino was about um, getting some seed money and then applying that seed money to migrate applications into the cloud and then harvest the money that was being used to sustain those applications on premise, and then reusing that money to restock the pond, if you will, for the seed money to migrate the next set of applications. And it was called Domino because the idea was that it would be self-sustaining. 
And one of the real challenges of that is that one of the core assumptions is not always true. And that is that those applications are actually resourced for sustainment where they live. Um, what we found is that many of the applications that were best candidates for migrating uh, had never been resourced to begin with. They were built by a program and drop shipped into a comm squadron. With no money allocated towards sustainment, it was just another duty as assigned uh, for that comm squadron. And so it wouldn't make sense for us to harvest sustainment dollars by you know, essentially getting rid of contractors and taking that money and putting it into a pot of, pot of money for a transition, because those were the same people who would have to do that work. And so I don't think the sustainment uh, uh, model, the, the live off the land model works if you haven't resourced your application sustainment. That being said, there's still an awful lot of uh, cost avoidance to be gained and savings, and you get, and you do get to savings at a certain point, but you've got to dig pretty deep down until you get there. Uh, and that's really what we're about. So I, I can't, I can't uh, uh, go into too much detail, but I can say that working through the Secretary of the Air Force's uh, mission initiatives and operational imperatives, um, we've made a pretty strong case for additional resources uh, to reduce tech debt. And that's where largely will this, this will go. Uh, and, and, and so uh, watch this space for results from the uh, 24 Palm, and uh, that will start to appear in the 24 budget submission when it goes in in the in the spring. And I see we have about eight minutes left, so we should probably do some triage on some of these. Yes, sir. I, I think we probably have time for two more, maybe. Um, so the next question is from Jason Flowers. He says. Uh, what do you recommend for a now solution to enable development at the unit level, uh, not programs of record or enterprise, uh, to, to, take an advan to take advantage of the upskilling efforts and allow new software to be one approved and two hosted? Please keep in mind that these unit level uh, efforts can upscale Air Force wide if they bring that level of value. Yeah, this is a great question and one that aligns very well with one that came into uh, the Vice Chief's Innovation Initiative. And it, but it was phrased a little bit differently. It said, "Hey, why you know, give me a give me a, a, a an ecosystem for citizen developer, right? For how can I can develop my own software, and 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 use it to support my job to do it uh, uh, on the network." And um, in in res researching the response, what we found is that there there are a lot of capabilities to do this similar work today. You know, going into the answer, I thought we were going to have to be tasked to develop a sandbox somewhere where folks could could write code and then put it on the network with all the you know the the the, the pedigree and testing challenges that would come with that um, but what we found is there's quite a bit if you look at it in terms of a continuum that we are already doing to enable this uh, we talked about some of the elements of it today but there's a couple more as well uh, for example, we have on our collaboration suite on on uh, on our Microsoft Office 365 capability, we have uh, an analytic tools that allow people to put algorithms in place and write code uh, through Power BI and Power Apps. Uh, we have uh, a low code, no code uh, solution through Appium that is sponsored by PEO Bez. Uh, which uh, allows people to manipulate build, building blocks of code and move data and manipulate it in such a way that will uh, do, do a, a chunk of this mission. Uh, we also have, um, uh, we talked about RPA as a way for people to manipulate data and, and get work done, uh, which may not be um, uh, somebody writing their own code, but it's, but it's, a, it's a, a Duplo approach to build Lego building, building blocks, uh, all the way up to Party Bus and on uh, Platform One, where more sophisticated organizations can write their own code in an environment that has already been certified and tested uh, to be secure uh, and inherit the controls associated with that on Platform One. So there, there is a continuum in place today that will enable some of this work at different levels, depending upon the mission area uh, that you're actually pursuing. And so I, I'm, I'm open to the idea if there's a gap somewhere that we need to fill with a new capability, I think we're doing a pretty good job of covering it down across those four areas on a, on a continuum.
Okay. And uh, uh, Mr. Flowers did have a follow up. He says, we're aware of plat platform one services, but they're fairly far from affordable. Um, but I, I do believe there's intent down the road as more users come online that the, the costs would drop. That's right. There's, there's some economies of scale here. And also Correct. platform one is the is the high end of that continuum. I wouldn't be the first place I would go to if I had a fairly well understood uh, transform that I wanted to perform. Yes, sir. All right. Now that okay. you have the difficult job of picking the last question. Yes, sir. So um, I just going in order as they came in here. So th this is the last question, unfortunately, due to time. But uh, it's from Derek Eichen. He says, I am finding in discussions with newly contracted companies that they are shocked with the idea of having to develop on, AF, on the AF, uh, AFIN, the DOTIN, and then the ATO, IATT uh, learning curve they have to climb. Should we as a government ensure the new IT service contracts have specific statements specifying this and all the ancillary equipment that is needed uh, that the developer would need so that this is not a shock to the motivated industry partner? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I really like the idea of a bidder's library that includes these, this type of information so that folks understand up front before they get into the business of uh, building a response to a proposal uh, about what the overhead associated with government contracting looks like. Um, now, normally when you're dealing with traditional government contractors, this is not a problem because they understand these requirements. They've been working them for a long time. But as we engage and reach out to non-traditional partners, understanding what these requirements look like is can, can be a steep learning curve, right? And as you point out. And so I am a big fan of the idea of putting this um, very basic information uh, as part of a bidder's library of having a discussion about this at a bidder's conference, even before when you're at the uh, draft uh, RFI stage and draft RFP stage uh, so that folks know what they're getting into. Uh, it can be challenging. Um, it can be a learning process, but there's also could be very lucrative uh, on the other end if they're able to be successful. And so uh, my, my sense is that uh, if they're motivated appropriately, uh, that they will continue climbing up that curve as opposed to, to bailing out. We're going to lose some, right? They're gonna, we're going to lose some folks who are going to say, I'm not interested in this, uh, in this esoteric world that you live in. Uh, and we're always looking at ways to simplify, but we are, of course, constrained uh, by what we can do in our acquisition processes and our security processes by what we get mandates from Congress, from DOD and OMB and the like. And I think that's about it. Yes, sir. We have about two minutes left, so I apologize I have... to everybody whose questions I didn't get to. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, very, very engaging talk, and I thank you uh, for taking time out of your schedule to come join us today. Uh, um, that truly, truly thought-provoking uh, discussion on our way ahead and the challenges that are associated with it, and it'll take a team to do so. I'd like to thank everybody online today for taking the time to join us as well with support uh, from our DoD innovators like Mr. Beauchamp. Innovation Connect has become a success, and we look forward to spotlighting more innovative projects in the future. Um, approved videos uh, from our Innovation Connect are available on the Department of the Air Force CDAO YouTube page. And if you have future topics for Innovation Connect, please send your recommendations to Ms. Ty Daniel and our team will review your proposal. Also, please follow our LinkedIn and Twitter accounts for more information on future events and registration. And with that, this does conclude today's Innovation Connect session. Our next session is slated for 10 November and our speaker will be announced soon on the uh, pages we referenced above. Thank you for your participation today. Mr. Beauchamp, again, thank you for joining us and we'll see everyone again next month.